Thank you for calling me and equipping me. And Lord, thank you for giving me your grace for this journey. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Some of you guys know that I have got uh, two young children. My oldest is two and a half years old. His name's Jonathan. Uh, and then we had our youngest just seven months ago. It seems to have flown by. Uh, and, but before I became a dad, I was one of those guys that was really always excited about becoming a father. And I spent lots and lots of time thinking about what kind of dad I would be and getting sure in my own mind of, of the things that I wanted to do when I became a dad. So if you are uh, parents now, and sometimes you'll see on social media or you'll, or you'll hear from other family members who are uh, becoming parents for the first time, them kind of talking about all the things they're going to do, do and, and all the things that they know about parenting, but you as a parent already, you kind of know, that's not how it's actually going to work, buddy. I was that terrible guy who thought I knew everything before the, the baby arrived. And, and even when Janine got pregnant, I used to talk to my friends. I used to say, oh, I'm going to be a really good dad. I'm going to make sure that I pray with him every night, even when he's a baby and he doesn't understand. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I would be full of all of this head knowledge of how to be a really good dad. And then we go in to have my first son, Jonathan. Uh, my wife has to have a C-section, and so I actually get to be in there when they pull Jonathan out, and the doctor holds him out to me for the very first time. I see this little baby in his hands, and all of a sudden, the head knowledge disappears. And he's holding him out, and the doctor's kind of got this irritated look on his face of, Do you, are you going to take your baby? And I, I'm looking back at him like, don't, don't give me a human life. <laughs> you don't know who I am. And all of a sudden, that head knowledge had just vanished, and my confidence about being a really good dad had disappeared, and the reason why was because there is a big difference between knowing something in your head, even knowing it in your heart, and then living it out. When I finally was confronted with a real little boy that I was going to be a dad to, I was terrified because it was much more difficult to do the things that I knew in my head than it was when I was before he was born. And that's where we're landing in Hebrews as we come to close, as we come to land the plane of this letter that we've been studying for the season of fall. We're landing in this place where the author is going to instruct us and talk to us about what it's like to actually live out the message of Jesus is greater. We've been talking about that over and over. We've been going through it in over 12 chapters now about the message of how Jesus is greater than everything else. He's greater than what has come before. He's greater than everything that will be. We've read about how Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, that he's greater than the angels, that he's greater than the tabernacle and the temple, that he's the greater high priest. We've read all this information, all this head knowledge and theology about who Jesus is and what he's done. But if you're anything like me, you've, you've been feeling as we've been going through this, no matter how spectacular, no matter how amazing these different bits of information about Jesus have been, wondering, well, what does that mean for me? What difference does that make in my life if that's who Jesus is? How am I supposed to react and respond in light of that. And that was probably the question of the Hebrews who received this letter. Remember, they were being persecuted. They were going through all kinds of different tribulations. And this author wrote them a letter, and his answer to their struggles of trying to be a Christian in their world was, Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than all you've ever known. Jesus is bigger than all you've ever known. But now he's going to finally tell them, and he's going to tell us this morning, what difference that should make in our life. Because good theology should always lead to doxology. Good information about Jesus and who he is and what he's done should always lead to a change in our life. Because we can't be Christians in our heads only. That's not how the gospel works. That's not how the message of Christianity and of Jesus works. 
It can't stay in our heads. It can't be simply something that we know. God demands of us from the Bible that our lives change, and he actually provides the means for our lives to change. So now we're going to look at what that change looks like. As we finished last week, we talked about this great race, this race that we all run in following Jesus, and now we're going to find out what it looks like to run that race. So if you guys want to read with me, we're going to be reading in chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, and then 20 and 21 as well. This is what the text says. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained the angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good thing that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So there's four principles here in this text that I want to talk about this morning. And the first one is to love people. When uh, I was growing up, uh, I had one older sister. Uh, she was eight years older than me, so quite a bit of a gap there. And uh, there was all kinds of sibling rivalry and sticky situations we'd get in together, as I'm sure you guys who have older or younger siblings know. Um, as I was thinking of stories to tell, I actually was speaking with her on the phone yesterday, and I asked her, can you remember any stories of when we were younger uh, and when we would get into arguments or fights? And she uh, told me a few things, many of which I probably couldn't share in a church. But uh, one in particular that I remembered that was quite embarrassing uh, was when I was younger, when I was first born, because my sister was so much older than me, uh, she, and she was actually hoping for a girl, but along came me instead, unfortunately. Uh, and so she decided she was going to remedy this problem by dressing me up as a girl. So her and her buddies would take little baby Andrew, they would dress me in little doll's clothes because I was small enough to fit in them, and then they would push me around in a stroller in the neighborhood. They would even sometimes put makeup on me. I don't know how my mother let her get away with this. Quite, I would, if I did that to my kids, Janae would kill me. But somehow my sister got away with it and she would do this with her friends again and again. And we actually have uh, vi photo pro photographic proof of this in a photo album at home, which my mom delights to show people when they come over. But our relationship was like that as kids. It went on for the entire time that we were young, right? Brothers and sisters don't get along that well. We all know the stories. So why is it that at the beginning of this passage, the author of Hebrews tells us to let brotherly love continue or let sibling love continue? Why is that the type of love that he chooses to tell Christians about or encourage us to live out? Because I'm tempted to say, well, I, I can think of some different types of love that might be a little bit better. But I want to try and explore that and what it means, what the author of Hebrews means when he says to let brotherly love continue. Because he uses a Greek word, Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is made up of two other Greek words kind of mashed together. The first half is phileo, and phileo is a type of love. In the, the Greek language, there was four different ways to describe love, and one of them was phileo. And phileo meant a, a bond of friendship that was very close. Uh, if you're familiar with the stories of Jonathan and David in the Old Testament, they had a phileo love together. They were bonded. Even though they weren't actually brothers, they were extremely close. They loved one another. They cared for one another. And then the second half of that word comes from a Greek word, Adelphus. Now, what Adelphus means is quite literally from the same womb. So what the author of Hebrews is saying is love and have a close friendship as if from the same womb, as if you were the, own, the same flesh and blood. That's the type of love that he's talking about. And what does that love look like? Well, he goes on to tell us to show hospitality to strangers. He tells us to 
Uh, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. And remember those who are mistreated because they are part of the same body, because they are our own flesh and blood. So when we think about loving people, when we think about this Jesus who is greater and the, the effect that that has on our life, the first thing that it does is it gives us a love for other people as if they were our own flesh and blood. As I have grown and as I have matured, I have very quickly realized that there is no one who understands, understands me like my sister. Even though there's a big generational gap between us, even though we are in different parts of the world now, even though there are many different things that have happened in our life, I have a love and a bond with my sister that I don't have with anyone. She's probably the person I'm closest to next to my wife because she's my sibling. And that's what the author of Hebrews is talking about, having a bond like that, not the kind of bond between brothers and sisters where there's squabbling or rivalry, but the bond where we understand one another because we are of the same flesh and blood, because we are all created in the image of God. We all have the same creator. We all have the same maker. So this is the type of love where it doesn't matter how different someone is from you, you can still love them. That's the type of love that Jesus gives us. That's the type of love that Jesus calls us to. So if you are in this church this morning, if you have different political beliefs, if you have different background, if you have different culture, if you have a different upbringing, we still love you. Jesus still loves you and he calls his church to love you as though you were his own flesh and blood. Because those differences don't matter. It doesn't change the fact that we are all in the same image of God. We are all called to love one another in this way as a result of this Jesus who is greater. And I think this is quite radical. I think this is very different than the culture that we live in and the message that we get about love most often. Because most often we are encouraged to love people because they're like us or because they have something that we connect with is similar to us. Well, let me ask you, if that was how love was meant to be, how could we possibly show hospitality to strangers who we've never met, who we don't know anything about them? How could we remember those who are in prison who are the epitome of everything that we should dislike because they're criminals? Yet God calls us to love those people. God calls us to think of those people as though they were our own flesh and blood. And it's not a mushy sentimentality type of love where we just, we love them and we talk about loving them. It's an action. It's a way to live out your life to care about those people, to call them to remembrance, to think about ways that you can love them, that you can think about their true benefit, what you can do to benefit them. That's the type of love that he's talking about. He's talking about sacrificing for them. He's talking about giving to them, making time for them, listening to them, forgiving them, and serving them. That is not the way the world loves. And most often, if we're honest, it's not the way that we love, but it is the love that Jesus bought for us, and it is the love that he calls us to, to love people. The second principle he gives us is to honor marriage. Now, just as a, a quick survey, how many people have seen the show, This Is Us? Is there anyone in here? A few. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you've probably heard about it. It is a very popular show right now on television. And This Is Us follows the story of a family as they've, they've grown up. It follows a married couple called Jack and Rebecca and their young children and the different trials and experiences that they go through as a family. And it kind of flashes back to when the kids were young and when Jack and Rebecca were young and then forward to when the kids have grown up. And the thing that everybody loves about this show is this incredible marriage that Jack and Rebecca have together. Because they go through so many difficult things, they go through so many trials and struggles and temptations, but they stick it out together. They love one another. And people watch the show and say, oh, I wish I could have a marriage like Jack and Rebecca. I wish I could be a parent like Jack and Rebecca. Because they love one another so much, they take care of one another. And I know some people who say that they cry at the end of every single episode. I will admit I've cried once or twice at this show. Because it is, it's incredibly powerfully emotional just seeing how this couple weathers life together. Now, in this passage, the author of Hebrews talks about honoring marriage. This is what he said in verse four. He says, let marriage be held in honor among all 
and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So this is kind of a, a serious moment. We don't know how to take this one. But this is why this is so important, is because to God, marriage is an incredibly sacred and holy thing. To God, marriage is not just something that we do because it's what everybody else does. Marriage is not something that we do because we have some kind of emotional need that we need to get ma- met. To God, marriage is a sacred and holy institution. It is a symbol of his love for us. When Christians enter into marriage, we believe that that's not just about two people loving one another and serving one another, but it is two people coming together to use an opportunity to show the world what God's love is like, that it's faithful, that it's committed, that it is a vow to us to always stand by us and forgive us. When two people get married, they come to the front of a church and they say, till death do us part. We don't often think about those vows anymore because they've become something that we just see at every wedding, but think about those words, think about what those words mean, that before God, a marriage vow is a vow till death do us part. That's how important marriage is to God, that's how sacred it is. Now we live in a culture that has changed the meaning of marriage quite a bit, in many ways over the years, but I would say that for the large part, we struggle with honoring marriage these days. And and I'm the first one to admit that I'm a part of that because I, I often forget what marriage is supposed to be about. Now, when we don't honor marriage, when we muddle with it and we change it and we redefine it and we get confused about the reason two people come together in a marriage, then we will do two things that I think are quite negative. The first is that we will hurt single people And the second is that we hurt married people. When we don't honor marriage as it's supposed to be, when we don't hold marriage in the place that God intended for it to be, we hurt single people because we make marriage about getting a need met in and of ourselves. Now, I want you to imagine being a single person and hearing the message of marriage that sometimes we hear now uh, while you are still single. This message that marriage is, is so that you can get a need met, you get married so that you can have what you need and what you want. If that's what marriage is and you're a single person, you're not gonna feel very good about yourself when you're being told that you need to be married to get this need met. The fact of the matter is is that marriage is not a necessity. It is not something that God has called everybody to. It's not something that you need to have. It is an opportunity, not a necessity. And furthermore, it's an opportunity to love God and to rejoice in God and to celebrate God, which is something that single people can do too. And that should be communicated. I, 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 w- I think that the church as a whole, at least in our Western culture, has not done a great job of talking about how important singleness is and how marriage relates to singleness as well. Because if you are a single person, you can still honor marriage without being married. You can pray for your friends who are married. You can support your friends who are married. They need your support. I will say as a married man, I need the support of my friends to do my marriage well. It is not just something that's exclusive for those two people in the marriage. If you remember it, most marriage ceremonies, there'll be a moment where they ask the congregation, will you be there to support this married couple when they get married as well? So honoring marriage is not something exclusive for married people, nor is it something that's about a need being met. The second thing that it does is that it hurts married people. Why? Well, again, if we are telling people that marriage is about getting a need met and marriage is about you, then you will go into marriage and drain the life out of your spouse. If marriage is primarily about you getting your need to be loved met, then you will go in there and you will drain the life out of your spouse. But if marriage is primarily about serving someone else, about giving your life for someone else as Christ gave his life for us, if that's what marriage is, then you will not drain the life out of your spouse, you will give life to them. If your primary mission in your marriage is to lay your life down and think about ways that you can encourage your spouse and uplift your spouse and help them when they struggle, and you're willing to put yourself aside to do that, think about the effect that would have on your marriage. If that's the way that we did marriage, people would stop looking at TV shows and saying, I want a marriage like that, when that marriage isn't even real. They would look to the church They would look to Christians and say, I want to have a marriage like that because there is two people who are willing to devote themselves to one another no matter what they go through. 
I don't always have a marriage like that, and it's not easy to have a marriage like that. Every single one of these things that we're going to be challenged about in this passage are not easy to do. But if we can look to Jesus being greater, if we can get a hold of that and listen to what he's telling us to do, then we'll find that there is incredible reasons to celebrate these things, that marriage can become something incredibly powerful, that the church can be the, the body that stands as a symbol of what marriage should be to the whole world. So let us all as Christians come back to a place where we can honor marriage as single people or as married people. And just as a quick mention to any students that are in here, because I get to spend a lot of time with students, one of the best things that you can do, because this applies to you as well, one of the best things that you can do as a student is you can pray for your parents. You can support your parents. Ask them about ways that you can love them and encourage them. Because it's hard to be married. So honor marriage. The third principle is to be content. Now, uh, if you'll remember that towards the end of the summer and, and throughout the summer, there was a number of hurricanes in south of, uh, of, of the United States. In Texas especially, there was uh, Hurricane Harvey, which blew through, and you saw more flooding in Houston than perhaps they had ever seen. Some of the, the pictures were just absolutely shocking to see entire interstates underwater. And... Throughout that, there were a lot of people that lost their homes. My, uh, my stepfamily is actually from Texas, and my dad was telling me stories of how friends they knew had houses worth close to a million dollars because they had no flood insurance. It was just all washed away. They lost it all. And in the midst of that, I was watching interviews, and there was one interview in particular where uh, there was an, a news reporter running up to people who were escaping the flooding and asking them about their stories, asking them, about where they were coming from, what they'd experienced. And he ran up to a man called Jeremiah. And the interesting thing about Jeremiah's story is Jeremiah came out and the news reporter said, tell us about where you're coming from, tell us what happened. And Jeremiah said, well, I was living in my first floor apartment with my six-year-old son. The, the floodwaters were coming in, so we had to escape to the second floor of the building because the waters were rising. And then the waters continued to rise, and so we had to escape out of a second floor window into a boat that was coming past. And we lost everything. We lost our car. We lost my son's clothes for school. We lost everything. Everything was in that house. But before the news reporter could follow up and say anything else, he said, but I am thankful. We are thankful because God is good. Now that video went viral. Uh, what that means is basically everybody was reposting and talking about this video on the internet. And the reason why it went viral is people in that set of circumstances don't normally talk like that. And people were watching this video and saying, man, I wish I could have that kind of attitude. That's the kind of attitude I want to have that if I lost everything, I could still be thankful, that I could still be thankful for my family and what I do have. In this passage, the author of Hebrews goes on to say, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The reason why people liked that video and were so blown away by it is people generally in our culture are not very content there's always something that we are hoping for, always something that we are looking to, to try and find our security and find our contentness. And we struggle. The reason why this passage mentions money is because throughout all of human history, not just our age, people have looked to money as their source of security, that that's where they try and find their contentness. That's why the author is linking those two things together. Don't love money, be content. Because most often, if we love money, we're not going to be content. We want more. We chase after more money because we want more security. But Jeremiah's story tells us that those things can be washed away in a moment. There's another Jeremiah I wanted to tell you about, a Puritan pastor, who said this about contentment. He said, the reason why you have not got contentment in the things of the world is not because you do not have enough of them, but because they are not things proportionable to that immortal soul of yours that is capable of God himself. The reason why we don't find contentment in this world, in the things of this world, in our money and our possessions, is that we were created for something far bigger than that. 
The problem deep within us is not that we don't have enough. It's that the things of this world couldn't possibly ever be enough, but Jesus can, because that is who we were created for. He is the end all, he is the be all of everything that we were made for. That's why we've spent 12 chapters talking about how great Jesus is, because he is at the center of everything. If we look to Jesus, then we will find contentment because he can give to us what the rest of the world is sorely lacking. This is what the Apostle Paul said in his life. He said, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The Apostle Paul who wrote that suffered lots of different, very painful trials. The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked, the Apostle Paul, people tried to kill him. He was imprisoned. He had broken relationships in his life. So I, I want you to keep in mind that when he writes that, that's not an easy thing for him to write. He's not writing that just because he wants to kind of fluff the readers up and he wants to make them feel good about their lives. He's saying, listen, I have gone through hunger and I've gone through satisfaction. I've gone through abundance and I've gone through need. And in both ends of that spectrum, it's Jesus who has been the one to make me content, who makes me satisfied, because he is the one that have, has what I need. Now, Jesus is not always going to give us what we want. There are going to be seasons of our life where we certainly want, but he does have what we need. Everything outside of Jesus is not a necessity. It's not something that we need. It's something that is simply a blessing that we can have. God will take care of us in every season. Jesus said, look at the lilies of the field. Look how God clothes them with splendor. How much more will he do that with you? Or look at the birds of the air, how they neither gather nor reap and store in barns, yet God provides for all of their needs. How much more will he do that for us? If God takes care of his creation, how much more is he going to do that for you and I, who he loves, who he calls his dear children? We really have a very hard time believing that, don't we? We see it and we, and we read it in our Bible, but it's one of those things, it's one of those pieces of theology that gets to our heads and not often to our hands or our hearts. Because not a lot of us can say what Jeremiah did when he lost his home, when he lost his car, when he lost his possessions. Not many of us in that moment can say, it's okay, we're thankful because we've got God. But my encouragement to you is that is what is on offer from God. That is an objective reality. That's a real thing. It's not just something that we can hope might happen one day. It is something that God can put in your heart through his Holy Spirit today. If we are willing to believe that Jesus is greater, if we are willing to look to him in that way. The last little principle that I want to go over is probably the one that uh, in our culture we won't like at all and that's to follow your leaders. The author says in verse seven, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then moving down a little bit in verse 17, he says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. We don't like this one. We don't like this principle of Christian living because in our culture, we are very, very individualistic. We like to be in charge of our own lives. We like to be the only ones who gets to have a say-so in, in the way that we are living. And outside voices are not easy to listen to. We're just kind of trained that way. But I think there are legitimate reasons why we struggle with this one as well because there have been abuses of power. There have been people who are in authority over us who have not done a good job, who have not led well. But my, I want to encourage you this morning to, to move those things to the side for the moment because what this passage is talking about, what God is challenging us on is not our leaders and how good a job they do, but he's challenging us on what our response to, should be. And this is not just church leaders. This is not just people in Christian ministry. This is anyone whom God has put over you as an authority. This could be a parent. It could be an employer. 
It could be someone who's mentoring you, who's been counseling you, a good friend. Anyone whom God has given you in your life to help lead you and guide you, let me ask you, are you a joy to be led by them? Are you a joy for your leaders to lead? That's the challenge of this passage. It's not to say that there are other things that leaders should be doing, but God's trying to take our focus of that because that's not our priority. That's not what we have a control over. What we have a control over is ourselves and how well we are going to be led. I don't like being led. I'm, I'm kind of an arrogant person. It's terrible, and I need to ask Jesus for forgiveness all the time. But this speaks to me because I know that in my arrogance, I have not always been the best to lead, especially for my mom. And so I'm trying to think, how can I be better to be, to be able to be led? How can I be a joy to my leaders? How can I be a blessing to them instead of a burden? How can I lead to their joy instead of their anxiety? What are the things that I can do as a follower of Jesus to bless those people who are in authority over me, who have to one day give an account for how they have led me? How can I support them? See, this isn't about being a yes man. It isn't about just doing what we're told. This is about showing grace to God's people who he has called to lead us. That's what following leaders is all about. Now, as we land this, I want to read verse 8 to us. Verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. These are the principles that are in this passage of how we are to live our lives in a response to the fact that Jesus is greater. But there's one most important thing that we need to remember if we are going to embrace all of these things, if we are going to try and live these out, is that they can't be about us. These are not ways in which we try and make God happy with us. They're not ways we live in order to go to heaven. They are not things that we do so that we can be called good people. If we do that, if we make it about us, if they're about adding something to our resume and making us better, then we will miss the point entirely of what these are supposed to be. Because the message of these principles and the idea behind them is not that I am supposed to be a better person, it's that Jesus is greater than me. Jesus is more important than I am. He should be at the center of my life, I should not be. The book of Hebrews, the whole kind of narrative arc of this letter has been all about how throughout history things have pointed towards Jesus. The, the temple and the sacrifices and all these amazing rituals that these people used to do, they were all just symbols and signs of what was to come. Now as we come to the back half of the letter, these principles are the things that can point back to him. These are the things that we can do in our lives that show people that Jesus is greater. These are the things that will happen in our lives if we truly in our hearts believe that Jesus is greater. If we believe that Jesus is greater, then we will love people. We'll love people because we will know that Christ has loved us, that he has been a brother to us, that he became the same flesh. Remember that at the start of Hebrews, that he became one of us from the same womb. We will honor marriage because we will know that marriage is about reflecting back to the world the glory of God's love for us, that he is committed, that he has made the vow to never leave us nor forsake us. We'll be content because we'll see the God who gave us everything in his son, the Jesus that is sufficient for all of our needs. We'll be able to say as the author talks about that what can man do to me, I will not fear because I have God who is my helper. We'll be able to stand out in society as the people that in abundance or need stand firm and are thankful because we have Jesus who is greater. And lastly, we'll be able to follow our leaders because we have Jesus who was in very nature God but did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing taking on the form of a servant. We'll follow our leaders because Jesus submitted himself to authority. Despite the fact that he was God, if anyone had a reason to complain about leaders and about the way that they conducted themselves, it was Jesus. But instead he chose to humble himself even to the point of going to the cross for sinful people like me. 
So that's what the message of Jesus being greater is all about. It's about Jesus being greater than us. It's about him being the center of our lives so that our lives communicate, not that we are great, but that he is great. Would you guys pray with me this morning as we close? Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for a fall filled with messages about how Jesus is greater, about how he is so much greater than us, that he's greater than the trials and the struggles of this world. Lord, as we remember the first hearers of this letter, we remember that they struggled and they persevered through so many difficult things. Yet this message of Jesus being great, it was able to sustain them and encourage them. Lord, I pray as we finish this letter together as a church now, Lord, that it would encourage us, that we would remember these great sweeping ways in which you are greater and that that would change our lives, that we wouldn't be Christians in our heads only, but Lord, that we would live these principles out, that we would love with brotherly affection, that we would honor marriage, that we would be content, and that we would follow the leaders that you have given us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we finish this morning, let me encourage any of you who need prayer or want to talk with someone just to get some support. Come, that's what this letter's been about, that's what this church is about. We want to make sure we're available to you. But this morning's benediction we can take right from the book of Hebrews itself. It says, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a good morning.